Welcome to the 12th episode of Kentucky Esports Weekly. My name is Nathan Stevens, and I'll uh, be your gaming guide today. Uh, we have a lot of exciting topics ahead of your way for this show, uh, including racing, racing, and even more racing. We have other items of interest, but looking at the rundown, racing might possibly be the light motif for today. So anyway, you can't wait for you to dig into everything, so let's get started with quick hitters starting it off surprisingly racing torque esports has wrangled in x games rally nitro circus and stunt driver travis pastrana to their virtual racing event pastrana was invited to the legends trophy event at the indianapolis motor speedway this past weekend and didn't hesitate in doing so Strana commented about his esports entrance by saying, I called Montoya because Connor Daly went from a back of the pack sim driver with me to title contender within a week of getting his Allen's sports rig, and Juan Pablo helped get me set up. Then he asked if I wanted to join his crew of legends for the event. It's such an honor to even be considered to race with these guys, so of course I didn't hesitate to take the opportunity. Pastrana is just another professional driver feather in the Torque Esports cap. That cap is going to be a bird soon if they keep this up. It's nice to see more and more real-world drivers making the virtual leap into esports. Can't wait to see how he does. Moving along, the PUBG Continental Series pick 'em up challenge is underway this week. PC and console ga- players can purchase special PCS1 items and receive voting coupons that will allow them to predict and vote for regional winners in the PUBG Continental Series. If they vote correctly, they, ha- they are entered to a chance to win unique and special items for PUBG for themselves. Players can purchase the items needed to receive voting coupons today and just in time for action to begin tomorrow. It's neat to see players who aren't esports participants still competing for some winnings in PCS. It's definitely a good way to keep players engaged in your tournament as well as build an audience. Always good to have an audience that is dedicated to you and moving when you move. Speaking of moving, moving on to news that should be filed under not really shocking. According to esportsinsider.com writer Yono Nicholson, NRG Esports-owned Chicago Huntsman has recruited the U.S. Army to, to its roster of partners. The U.S. Army is not a newbie to the esports circuit as it has taken part as a sponsor in several esports-related events, including a broadcast segment called Tactical Play. Having been to many E3s over the year, I can confirm that the U.S. Army is always, always interested and present in the gaming world, and very much so when it comes to first-person shooters. Not surprising. They had their own FPS at a past E3 once. I cannot recall the name of it. And their involvement can be traced all the way back to Battlezone with Atari. So they've been very present and very aware of gaming for a long, long, long time. In short, this isn't a surprising announcement. They're a good sponsor. And with that, we have finished quick hitters for the day. So let's shift gears and get some industry news with Haley and Tyler. Hello, I'm Tyler Ralston. And I'm Haley Salyers. And this is the week's industry news. First off, Star Wars Battlefront II from EA suffered a history-making bad launch and would go on to receive free support for a few years to come before finally being dropped this past April. Of all the game modes added and altered, of all the heroes brought to its war fronts, the Starfighter mode was largely left untouched to the disappointment of many fans. While it seems instead of adding onto that mode in Battlefront 2, EA has decided to turn the entire experience into its own title with Star Wars Squadrons. On the 18th, EA released a trailer to get people excited for the new space dogfighting sim, with a bit of cinematic gameplay showing the inside of the cockpits of Imperial Ties and Rebel Fighters. Information tells us that matches will be 5 versus 5 PvP from a first-person view inside the cockpit, with tons of tricks and maneuvers for all the competing space pilots out there, such as diverting power from different systems to overcharge a function of your choice, such as shields or blasters. The game will even feature VR support to truly drive home the immersion for players with the proper hardware. An interview can be found on Polygon that goes more in-depth about Star Wars Squadrons, and the scheduled release date is October 2nd on Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC. The trailer is out now for Resident Evil 8. Officially titled Resident Evil Village, the game serves as a direct follow-up to the events of Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. 
This will be another first-person survivor horror game that follows the lead character of Ethan Winters. A few years have passed since the events of Biohazard, and Ethan is moving on from the horrors found in the Baker Mansion. However, the unexpected appearance of Chris Redfield flips Ethan's new world upside down. The return of popular series character Chris Redfield has left many fans with questions about his role in this latest story. Fans will have to wait for those answers, though. The trailer, debuted at the PS5 Future of Gaming event, offers only a brief look at gameplay, but it does confirm the appearance of werewolves in the story. It also offers a look at the village itself, a stark difference from the dark and cramped corridors of Biohazard. Kellen Haney of Capcom notes that the fear element this time around is the fear of the unknown. Please note that Resident Evil Village will not be available for current-gen consoles, likely due to its heavy use of graphics and the exploration-driven storyline. Fans are curious to learn if the game will be available, available for PSVR. With more information to be announced later this year, Resident Evil Village is expected for launch on the Xbox Series X, PS5, and PC sometime in the next year. An official release date has yet to be announced. In a statement on Twitter, CD Projekt Red has unfortunately informed their fans once again that their upcoming game, Cyberpunk 2077, is getting another delay. However, this one isn't as bad as the first, just pushing it back to November 19th. The statement explains that CD Projekt Red understands it is disappointing for fans, but they truly believe in the concept of ready when it's ready, and intend to craft a game that provides every player with a worthwhile and lasting experience. According to the message, the game's overall content is complete enough to play, but the team wants to take the extra time to closely examine this complex world in depth and remove any issues they come across from bugs to game balance. Cyberpunk 2077 will come to last-gen Xbox One and PlayStation 4 during initial release and eventually be brought to Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 when it's ready. Recently, a leak popped up on 4chan pertaining to the classic Crash Bandicoot franchise featuring numerous tidbits of information about a new upcoming game, Crash Bandicoot 4, It's About Time. First are some screenshots of gameplay, which, while lower in resolution and a bit blurred, feature iconic items such as masks and explosive nitro boxes, and characters such as Crash, Coco, and Neocortex, who all may be playable. The art style is just as vibrant and cartoonish as expected from the franchise. Digital purchases are also revealed to be reward of a special, totally tubular, skins for both Crash and Coco. Some of the informative splash images show the Xbox icon, and the game is also confirmed to be coming to PlayStation 4. The release date shown is October 9, 2020, but that could change. Toys for Bob, the developers, tweeted more info is coming on the 22nd, so by the time this episode airs, more information should be available. In other news about returning classic titles, the Pokemon Company recently revealed a new Pokemon Snap game appropriately titled New Pokemon Snap. Much like the original, it appears this unique spin on the Pokemon franchise will feature an on-rails shooter type experience. Instead of capturing Pokemon, players are taken across different landscapes and environments to research the numerous Pokemon and their interactions within their natural habitats. Doing so will contribute to the photo decks, and it is likely that capturing unique behaviors or events will yield a better score for the player. There is no current release date, but the trailer does provide a link to pokemon.com forward slash new Pokemon Snap, which shares a bit of information and a few screenshots. At the end of EA Play Live, EA announced the development of a new skate game. The original skate was released in 2007, but there hasn't been a new skate game since 2010 Skate 3. In their announcement, EA offered, well, nothing really outside of a confirmation for the game. As of now, Skate 4 is simply in development. Platform specifics and a release date weren't mentioned, and even the name Skate 4 isn't a guarantee. The company did acknowledge that the new skate game is only happening because of fan excitement. Creative director Cus Perry said, quote, You commented this into existence. EA rival Activision has already announced the release of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 later this year for PS4, Xbox One, and PC, so EA may not be in too much of a rush to offer a game in the same genre. We'll share more ski de details as they're available. And that's all for the industry news this week. Now back to Nathan. Thank you, Haley and Tyler. Uh, the Ben Branscombe has returned this week with another industry interview. This time, he sits down with eSports driver Zach Novak, who is currently the iRacing eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series reigning champion, and chats it up. Take it away, Ben. All right. Hey, everyone. And today I get the honor and pleasure of speaking with a NASCAR champion, Zach Novak. Zach, how are you doing today? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for coming on. So I kind of want to start off with uh, just tell us a quick little uh, short thing about who you are and what you're about. Yeah, so I'm uh, 
a NASCAR driver, a NASCAR driver for Richmond Raceway Esports. I'm 18 years old from Connecticut. Um, I've raced my whole life since I was five years old. Um, I moved to online racing when I was uh, 12 or 13. And um, from there, uh, it, it's taken off pretty, pretty good. Um, and I've gotten to the point where um, this is pretty much all I do. You know, uh, I, I'm lucky enough to, you know, be in the position of, of where I can um, race every other Tuesday um, as my primary job right now. So um, it's always a cool thing when you get to do something you like to do. Nice. I actually didn't know you've been racing since five. So that's actually pretty yeah. cool. I take it you started off in go karts then. Yeah, I, I raced quarter midgets for about six or seven years. Nice. I, I respect that. So um, kind of just for everyone at home, talk about your time that you've spent on iRacing. That's kind of, I guess you kind of mentioned it. It's kind of what you kind of do for a living now. So just talk about how you got started and ended up to the point where you're at now. Yeah, so actually a friend I met from quarter midgets um, got me involved in iRacing. I was at his house for uh, the Daytona 500 in 2012. And um, that's how I learned about it. Um, I begged my parents to buy me a wheel, and um, I used one of our, you know, bad laptops we had hanging around the house. And, um, you know, it was an Xbox wheel that would break every two months, and I'd have to go buy a new one. And um, it turned into, you know, I finally upgraded that wheel to something uh, that would last, and um, finally just kept upgrading and upgrading. And, and working towards getting better. And then <clears throat> in uh, 2016, I, I realized that, um, you know, I might actually be able to go pro and, um, you know, I just kept working at it and working at it. And, and here we are. Nice. So uh, kind of just talk about what it was like to go pro in a sense and like explain to the people watching what that ensues or what that entails. You know, I, I didn't really realize how important it actually was because, um, I racing wasn't as big as, as it is now, obviously. And, um, it was pretty small for the most part in, in relative to, um, any other racing really. So, um, you know, it, it didn't really feel like you were professional at anything. Um, <laughs> it was just kind of like a, like a fun thing and you made it to the top series and congratulations. But, uh, now, you know, it's, it's, you're actually like, professional you're doing professional social media stuff uh meetings with teams and in the whole nine yards and um you know it's a lot different but I, I like it a lot i really do because um it's brought me out of my comfort zone a little bit um I'm, i've always kind of been you know somebody that stays at home and i don't like to go out and stuff so um to kind of be put out of my comfort zone on social media and be put out in front of people is is always really cool Nice. That's awesome. Um, so we got to talk about it. You're technically the reigning champion for yeah. the e NASCAR racing Coca-Cola series. Yeah. Uh, kind of just talk about what entailed in that year you drove for, I'm going to butcher their name, Roush Fenway. Is it e, e gaming or e racing? I don't know their actual, team I don't, name. I don't know what they're uh, going by now. I don't know if it's Roush Fenway gaming or if they're doing racing still, I'm not sure, but, okay. um, in that case, then just talk about what it was like to number one, be a part of a major motorsports team in Roush Fenway and number two, just go out and win a NASCAR championship. Even though, even though it's on our racing, it's still like you still are a NASCAR champion in the record books. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really cool that NASCAR, you know, considers it one of its own, um, NASCAR themselves consider it a NASCAR championship. So that's good enough for me. You know, I, I don't need the, the people on Twitter and stuff to tell me it's not because NASCAR <laughs> saying it is. So, um, that's always really cool. And, um, to drive for Roush, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the most legendary teams at NASCAR. And, um, you know, when they picked me in the draft, that was, that was really, really cool to be able to represent their sponsors and whatnot. Um, and they were all really good to me and, um, all really good people. And, um, again, just to, to drive that legendary number six car, that was, that was so cool. And, um, to have the success that I had um, last year in that car is just even more special. Mm -hmm. And now you drive for Richmond Raceway Esports, correct? Yes. Nice. So what, what's it been like teaming up with the team from a track, basically? Um, it's been great. Um, 
it was a really, really tough decision for me to leave Roush, and um, I lost a lot of sleep over it for sure. Uh, but uh, my best friend, Jimmy Mullis, uh, who drives the 46 for Richmond, um, he obviously was there last year and uh, returned this year, and he was a big driving factor in getting me over to Richmond Raceway. And um, I went with him to the, the spring race last year, and um, they, they were all really nice, all the staff. Uh, they welcomed me like, you know, I was already on the team and, and I was a part of Roush at that point. So, um, you know, I, I just felt like it was it was a good opportunity for me and um, I, I had to take advantage of it when I could. Yeah, no, that, I totally understand that. It makes sense. Um, I kind of want to ask, what does it mean to you to, number one, be a race fan and have these – teams like these major teams like Roush I know Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Junior Sports have been doing iRacing stuff Steve Letarte Jeff Burton what does it mean for you to have the faces of the sport and like major teams to just step in and say hey we're gonna go almost all in on this and support it 100 percent yeah it's it's really cool um I actually met Junior um in person he came to our little rented house I guess on the on the lake in Lake Norman um when we had our media day, he came over uh, because his driver, Michael Conti was there. And uh, we got to talk to him face to face about how all this stuff works. And uh, he's, he's so involved and, and that's uh, obviously the, the biggest figure to be involved with it. And um, it's just so cool how much he supports it and how much he understands that, um, you know, we, we all put in a lot of time and you have to, put in a lot of effort to be good at this stuff and it's not just uh it's not just an arcade game or anything like that you know um so it's everything to be good at it you have to take a lot of time and that's the one thing that i really like about um you know all these nascar drivers coming in is they they respect that and they understand that um it you know all of us are are talented and and we put a lot of time into this stuff Mm-hmm. That's definitely a big thing that happened since the start and now finish of the Pro Invitational Series from NASCAR when the season was put on hold. Um, I got to ask, you're 18 years old. Uh, a lot of colleges across the United States are starting up esports programs, just in general. Nothing to, like some dealing with high racing, but just in general, they're starting to get more traction. I know here at the University of Kentucky, we are starting to grow our esports programs and stuff. I kind of want to ask what it means to you, someone who's getting ready to come to a university, possibly, just what it means for you to see colleges and universities across the country taking that step and showing that they have an interest and in showing that they want to grow esports. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's awesome because not everybody is super athletically gifted or anything like that. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're going to college, then you definitely um, pay attention in school and, and you're working hard at that. But um, to be able to, you know, have, I guess, like play for an esports team um, at college is really cool um, because you can um, – kind of drawing a blank here sorry Mm -hmm. (laughs) um because you you can just learn so much from the college atmosphere you know like obviously it's it's very similar to the the aspects of college football and and baseball and basketball and whatnot where um you're still getting your education but you're still learning how to improve at at that certain um esport in this case so um you know, that could help train you go pro or even just as a side hobby, even um, while you're getting your education. And I think that's extremely important. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, So I got to ask, you're NASCAR champion. And I remember watching the E Homestead Miami race last last fall and just being blown away. At, I got to ask, take us through those last two or three laps of just what it was like to just go out there and put it all on the line and take home with the win. Um. I uh, I wasn't nervous that whole race uh, until the very end. Um, those last three laps are pretty nerve wracking. I can't lie, but um, that was the most prepared I've ever felt mentally for a race, um, which is really weird to say. But I just kind of went into it like, you know, I, I put myself in this position. If I if I don't win, it is what it is. You know, there's not really much you can do. Nice. And um, so I I just tried to prepare myself mentally and. and not make mistakes and, and just race my race. And then um, we got dealt like the perfect set of cards at the end of the race. And um, 
you know, we our car started to fade away a little bit, and then Keegan, who was the fastest car the whole race, um, started to come back, and and that's when it started to get a little nerve wracking for sure. But um, I knew if I just if I just didn't make a mistake, it was going to be almost impossible for him to pass me by the end of that race. Nice, yeah, I remember. I remember watching it live and like you crossing the finish line and it cut to your in camera and yeah. then it's your mom and your family just running in. It was just such an yeah. amazing and touching moment. Cause you have that connection. Like, like drivers have that connection in real life when they win a championship, like they get out pit road and there's a crew, but then like immediately it's just you and then your family just is immediately there to celebrate with you. So I'm sure that was a, that was a special moment for you to have. So um, Zach, I know you're probably super busy and want to get to other things. So that's talking to me. So we'll let you go, but I do have one last question. And it's what games are you playing right now? I figure, I think I know the answer, but I just got to ask it. What are you playing? All right. So um, the game I've been playing recently, very recently within the last two weeks is Escape from Tarkov. I've been grinding uh, that game big time. So uh, that game's really fun. Uh, I have a lot of hours in Rust. Uh, that game's awesome. Uh, one of my favorites. Uh, I play League of Legends sometimes. Um what else do I play? Uh, the 2K series, NBA 2K. Nice. nice. Um, that's pretty much it. I, I have like 500 hours in Rocket League on Steam. So nice. You, um, my roommate and you would get along perfectly. Then, so. <laughs> yeah. Terrific. Well, Zach, thank you so much for this. We really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks. Another great interview from Ben Branscombe. And many thanks to Zach Novak for joining us. Elias Conwell and his crew are bringing you History in 5 Minutes just starting now. Welcome, ladies and gents, to History in 5 Minutes. Our goal is to cram as much history as we can of games and game companies you know and love in under 5 minutes. Konami was founded on March 21st, 1969 in Toyonako, Osaka. Originally as a jukebox rental and repair company by Kagemasa Kozuki. It wasn't until four years later that Konami Industry Company Limited was introduced as its business practice shifted to creating arcade machines. The company name of Konami comes from using the pieces of the founder's surname, which means small wave in Japanese. Around the 1970s, Konami moved from just manufacturing arcade machines to creating their own games under Konami software. The first game made was a maze game simply called Maze. Konami published a handful of games including The Block Game, Astro Invader, Space War, and Space King, a Space Invader replicate which never really got much attention. Konami gained success in the 1980s with Frogger, Scramble, and Super Cobra. Frogger became one of the Konami's most famous game at the time. It was a simple yet addictive game that consists of a frog trying to cross dangerous streets and rivers. Frogger was one of the first games to use CPUs, making it technologically advanced for that time. Konami is also known for its password, the Konami Code, which traditionally gives many power-ups in its games. The Konami Code was created by Kazuhisa Hajimoto, who was developing the home port of the 1985 arcade game Gradius for the NES. Finding the game too difficult to play through during testing, he created a cheat code to give the player a full set of power-ups, which is normally attained gradually throughout the game. After entering the sequence using the controller when the game was paused, the player received all available power-ups. The mistake was discovered after release, but developers decided to leave it in there, as removing it could result in new bugs and glitches. The sequence was easy enough to remember for testers and simultaneously sufficiently hard to enter accidentally during the gameplay for unsuspecting users. In June 1991, Konami's legal name was changed to Konami Company Limited, or Konami Kabushiki Gaisha, and their headquarters would later be located to Minato, Tokyo, in April 1993. The company started supporting the 16-bit video game consoles during this period, starting with the Super NES in 1990, followed by the PC Engine in 1991, and the Sega Genesis in 1992. After the launch of the Sega Saturn and PlayStation in 1994, Konami became a business divisional organization, with the formation of various Konami Computer Entertainment, or KCE, subsidiaries, starting with KCE Tokyo and KCE Osaka, which would be later known as KC Studios in April 1995, followed by KC Japan, which was later named Kojima Productions in April 1996. Each KCE subsidiary would end up creating different intellectual properties such as KCE Tokyo Silent Hill series and KCE Japan's Metal Gear Solid series 
as a revival of the Metal Gear series on the MSX. In 1997, Konami started producing rhythm games for arcades under the Bomani brand and branched off into the collectible card game business with the launch of the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game. In July 2000, the company's legal English name was changed to Konami Corporation, but the Japanese legal name remained the same. As the company transitioned into developing video games for the 6th generation consoles, they branched out into the health and fitness business with the acquisitions of People Company Limited and Dai Olympic Sports Club Inc., which became Konami's subsidiaries. In March 2006, Konami merged all their video game development divisions into a new subsidiary known as Konami Digital Entertainment Company, or KDE. The absorption of Hudson Soft in 2012 resulted in the addition of several other franchises including Adventure Island, Bonk, Bloody War, Bomberman, Far East of Eden, and Star Soldier. In April 2015, Konami delisted itself from the New York Stock Exchange following the dissolution of their Kojima Productions subsidiary. In a translated interview with Nikkei TrendyNet published in the following month, the newly appointed CEO of Konami Digital Entertainment, Hideki Hayakawa, announced that Konami would shift their focus towards mobile gaming for a while, claiming that the mobile is where the future of gaming lies. In 2017, Konami announced that they would be reviving some of their company's other well-known video game titles following the success of their Nintendo Switch launch title, Super Bomberman R. Major titles by Konami include the Action Castlevania series, the survival horror Silent Hill series, the action shooter Contra series, the platform adventure Ganbare Goemon series, the stealth action Metal Gear Solid series, the role-playing Suikoden series, the Bimani Rhythm Game series, which includes Dance Dead Revolution, Beat Mania, Guitar Freaks, Drum Mania, and Poppin' Music, among others, Dancing with the Stars, the dating simulation Toki Meki Memorial Series and Football Simulation Pro Evolution Soccer. Konami produces shoot 'em up arcade games such as Gradius, Life Force, Time Pilot, Gyrus, Paradis, Axley, and Twin B. Konami's games based on cartoon licenses, especially the Batman the Animated Series, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Tiny Toon Adventures, and Animaniac series, but other American productions like The Simpsons, Bucky O'Hare, G.I. Joe, X-Men and the Goonies, and French comic Asterix all have seen released at some point in the past by Konami either on arcades and or video game consoles. The point is, Konami has made a ton of games. Will they make more? Probably. But in the meantime, make sure you check out my personal favorite Metal Gear Solid series. Or play Yu-Gi-Oh! because Yu-Gi-Oh! is still a thing. But anyway, thanks for watching History in 5 Minutes. So stay safe and stay gaming. Thank you, Elias. Here is Nick Hughes and his Opinionated Gamers with Push to Talk. Greetings, people of wherever our audience <laughs> What's up? Are watching from. What's up, guys? I got something I didn't get to say last week. So uh, Hurry up and Google say Sadia, it. Um, accidentally leaked a build of uh, of Gods and Monsters or whatever, the new Ubisoft. Yeah, uh, under the so title of Morbius, right? Played it, I think so. I don't know anything about that. I just know what happened. And for the three people that played it, let us know if it's good. That's it. It's <laughs> hilarious. Oh, that's Google. a good bit. It's a good <laughs> bit. Get it? Because no one uses Google Stadia? Yes, it sucks. Anyway, oh, yeah. but uh, legitimately, I am very excited for that game. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Like I, I'm that's like their Breath of the Wild, and I'm. I've it's been the even games. more into yeah. technology <laughs> lately. Expectations. Yeah. Like if you all, if you all haven't played, and this is to the people on the panel, this is to the viewers, everyone, everyone, everyone. Believe. If you have not played Hades by Supergiant Games, Missing what are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing? That's probably my game what of the am summer. I doing? Uh, up there with Valorant. Did you say, what is it, Elias? No, I said, what am I doing? Like, you know, you yeah, what, what, yeah, with Elias. Like, what it's am I doing? It's like a, it's like a dungeon crawler, hack and slash, roguelike. It's super giant. It's, just, it's a super giant game, so it's gorgeous. The voice acting will give you chills. It's so the best cool. Greek mythology cool. representation ever. Yeah, probably, yeah. It's oh, so good. Phenomenal. Just um, play it. Big update coming out sometime. They're in the technical beta this right now, so end of June probably. But anyways, moving on. Uh, some news. Some gaming news. There's a so there's a video game Hall of Fame, which I didn't know that. I mean, I guess you know deep down I kind of knew that. Like, of course that's a thing, right? But I was like, who makes yeah, these decisions? Funny. That's dumb. Someone can't just say that it's they have a Hall of Fame and, and call it that. Oh, but apparently it's pretty. The CEO of video games runs it. It's yeah, apparently yeah. like the strong international center uh, for like the history of electronic gaming, so it seems fairly legitimate. 
Yeah, well, oh, it sounds oh, fancy. Yeah. Like Minecraft yeah, just got okay. inducted to it. Wow. So that's kind of cool. Like and I mean, I get it. Minecraft, I feel like, is pretty important to gaming. Yeah. Like, whether you like it or not, it's it's a big deal. It had a big impact. Mm -hmm. um, and while questioning questioning the legitimacy of this list, I saw that Super Smash Brothers Melee is on it, so it has my endorsement, and it is, in fact, the best list. Uh, now, <laughs> yep, that's now all after you need. seeing that, that's all I needed. Yep. Um, so, yeah, go learn more about that. That's a fun thing that I didn't know. Uh, Snake's oh, on there, like, from the Nokia phone, Snake. Oh, wow. Uh, Last of Us 2 drops Snake Friday. I know we have a bunch of losers on this panel who haven't played The Last of Us 1, every single one of you. <coughs> well, honestly, what are you talking about? I I I I ba I I finished the game when or my second run through bef right before the right before two. Yep, before two. Yep. Have you got two yet? I I did get two. Yes. Nice. I uh, uh, I haven't played, played it yet. yet. I haven't yes, played I, it yet. Was, so let's we're gonna keep this spoiler free for yeah. sure. But uh, it's apparently Sony's like fastest selling game of of this generation, which goes back quite a bit now. So that's saying something. Um, yeah. but I mean, oh, it lasts. I wanted to wait till I had some time to like sit down and like play it you know yeah yeah that's fair i hear you yeah because that's like that's one that like that's why i've been big into like hades and valorant mm -hmm. because like it's a rogue hades is a rogue like you pick it up you play you give a run through however long it takes 20 Next minutes. Time is 40 minutes to beat the game probably and yeah 40 minutes at the longest run um and then you restart and you can put it down valorant's 30 40 minute matches you can play spike rush though which is like eight minutes yeah, it's so fast. Um, yeah, I've I've been in Rocket League. I've been big into those. You know, pick up, put it down. Um, yeah. So I, I I agree with Elias. I really that's a game I want to be able to binge. Yeah. Like right. hard. Um, I I another thing that happened is disagrees. <laughs> guess we got to talk about it. I just I don't I don't even want to give it the limelight. Pokemon DLC. Let's not. Um, so EA Live. <laughs> And All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pokemon, Pokemon Snap. Snap. Yeah. Did, that, did that happen Pokemon since our last Snap thing? is huge. Yeah, yeah no, I don't think we got to talk about that last time. I think was, no. that happened since then. I'm so excited. Um, and Switch is such a good platform for that, too. But did I he – is that the game that doesn't allow for a full screen? I hope not. No, okay. there's some Switch game coming out that was, like, big, oh. but they don't it, – it won't work if you try it. It's, like, only handheld. You'll have to, we'll have to look into that and talk about it next week. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. whatever you that is, and whatever you that is, I'm limitation. angry. <laughs> that shouldn't be a thing. That defeats the whole purpose. That's the of whole the point of the switch. Yeah. 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 You know oh, another um, Pokemon thing that got announced at the Pokemon no. Direct thing? What? What was it? Uh, that Pokemon Smile. Is that the cafe puzzle game? No, no, no oh, that, that's yeah, cafe but... mix. The Smile oh, one is a, is an AR app for brushing your teeth for kids. Right, dude. It, I think it, AR is the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> so, so essentially, AR over like, VR. You're, you're like teeth are color coded, and you're and it's supposed to help kids like brush their teeth. And like, if they get all the color coded things, then they can catch like a little chibi version of a Pokemon. <gasps> now, now that's I'll, using your powers for good. That is. Yeah, cute. I was that's, joking that's with adorable. my uh, my roommate, cool. and I was like, well, I bet you a um, a thirty year old is going to get that. And they're just going to be like sitting there <laughs> scrubbing for like an hour. It's like, I'm, I'm going to get that. I'm going to get that. Dude, talk uh, talk EA for us since okay. we're not good. Pokemon uh, Isle of Armor DLC, uh, bad. bad. Still as bad as the base game. Just, yep, there's our opinion. Moving on. Sorry, right. Pokemon love. So, <laughs> EA had a like hour long press event to say two things. And that's that Apex Legends is coming to other consoles and there's going to be cross play and that skate's coming out or a new skate's going to be coming out. They also did a lot of stuff that's like, oh, uh, we realize the origin's bad, so we're going to put everything on Steam. But I knew that for years. Yeah, so, but oh, they're also doing some pass that you can buy, though, for Steam, right? That's like yeah, an well, additional cost. They've had that for a little bit anyway. It's like, yeah, uh, EA like yeah, that you pay like $15 a month and that you can play like whatever EA gets. Catch me not doing team. that ever. Yeah. But the new, like pass the new skate is The new skate is big. The new skate is giant. Yeah. New, new skate is big. Amazing. People who play Apex, I'm sure, are excited for Dude. Apex cross-platform, but... I don't want Apex I mean, on my PC because I don't have room, like, just for Apex Legends. But I have room for it on my Switch because I'm sure it's going to be, like, way less big. And if it has gyro, that's fine. It is chunky. Yeah, but imagine trying to play a legitimate first-person shooter. I'm not playing it for fun. I'm just Switch. playing it because Harry wants us to play it. 
I'll do anything for Harold Mann. That's one of mine and Nick's friends. He, he works with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's well, works with you. Amazing I'm human. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Me. You got yeah. fired. Yeah. <laughs> this is my last. Uh, this is my no, last. He graduated. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah any, any last minute shout outs? Uh, the Star Wars Squadrons. Looks yeah. Pretty. No. Any last shout outs? At Star Wars Squadrons. <laughs> yeah. No. Any last shout outs? Come on! I oh, like that. Um, <laughs> something was coming out soon that I was excited about, and I can't remember what it was. So never mind. Who cares? No. Yeah, I'm trying to. Th- I'm trying to also think. Uh, well, there's Sims. Um, I'm just not. Like, they just shouldn't have made Origin. They just should have left everything on Steam from the get go. I feel like yes. they wasted so much of their own potential by making Origin. Yes. That's you know, at least the Epic Games launcher gives you free stuff. What did, what did EA ever do for Epic me? Epic Games like, Launcher, so I, I'm mad I ever got mad at it because it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty Honestly, good. I just that's what I, got, that's what I have Hades on. Uh, shout out to Steam for having really good controller support. That's my shout out. Uh, oh, except yeah. sometimes it still gets angry at my DualShock 4, but that's okay. It happens. Yeah, you try. I, I get angry at your DualShock At least game. I can use it. I'm pretty sure Epic Games dislikes DualShock 4s. Uh, I, for some reason, oh. Microsoft computers only like the Xbox controller, which, of course, I know why. I'm saying. I'm thinking about reason. getting an Xbox controller just for my PC. Like, I don't even own an yeah. Xbox, but. Yeah, yeah same. <laughs> you can get um, off brand ones for 20 bucks on Amazon. Maybe when the new Xbox whatever comes out, the Xbox Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk. controllers will drop in price. Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. Cyberpunk. I, I highly doubt it. Cyberpunk All right. Blade? Yep, it got delayed again. Wait, wait, ho, ho, till when? I have no idea. Guys, we're ending the show. You can't drop that now. You can't drop that on us, dude. Elias, what's wrong with you? I I thought he froze for a second. It was just going to be frozen on that little smirk with that, like, dropping that news. I was going to have to end it there. (laughs) I haven't said till when. It's just a a cliffhanger. It's a forever delay. All right, we're, we're hogging the limelight now. Yeah, that's Even the best thing. Thank we're you clearly, so we're clearly, you know, why people are here. Yeah. Just Shout to the Nathan to the messy Bam. buns everywhere. <laughs> well, not more, dude. Elias just got us canceled by bringing up this thing. Yeah, thanks, Elias, for canceling us. I really appreciate that. He's, he's frozen. Oh, my goodness. He is frozen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope that shows up. All right. All right, so everyone, nice. everyone say your goodbyes. Hey. Right. Bye. Bye, guys. It doesn't matter. So, take it away, Alex. What you got going? Hey, so we've got a couple events coming up. The first one tomorrow is called the Cats Cats Smash Clash. So that will be a, uh, every Thursday will be a Super Smash Brothers tournament. Uh, this first one that is uh, airing tomorrow on our Twitch channel will be uh, just for incoming freshmen. Everybody's already registered, but... Stay tuned for information on how to register for future tournaments. There are prizes, gift cards, and those will, I believe, continue every week. And we will also have drops for people in chat. So tune in there. uh, I think there'll be some T-shirts and some other gear from UK and Gen G. There will be uh, some exciting stuff going on there. That's going to be every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. And then we also have coming up the uh next week we've got dr anthony lampiros he will be interviewed by uh uk's christina walker dr lampiros is going to give us a kind of brief history of gaming to set him up to talk about some of the research that he has done um, in gaming both himself and general research that's going on what that means for us socially what the social effects of gaming are with a focus on violence in gaming and what the research tells us about that. So that will be next week, July 2nd at 4 p.m. So that is what we've got going on. Cool. That sounds fun. Um, It's a little bit of Smash Brothers fun. Then you get to learn a little bit about gaming and research. That is a good combination always. (laughs) Very cool. Um, All right. Well, what do you want to do first? We got five questions. As uh, that is our that's our scheduled week, um, flip flopping between unpopular opinions and five questions, and we also got a little bit of a treat that I know you're excited about. So, uh, oh, yeah. what, what you feeling? Let's uh, let's take a look at uh, at at the treat. The, uh, <laughs> you're you're keeping our our viewers in suspense here. What do you oh, got? Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, about a week or so ago, Konami sent a TopoGrafx-16 Mini, which are uh, incredibly difficult to to get right now because of uh, the coronavirus that's that's uh, kind of slowing down a lot of shipments coming out of China and uh, I believe Japan. But uh, but this is a wonderful. I mean, I can't say enough about this. Yeah. It's a miniature TurboGrafx-16. The TurboGrafx-16, if you don't know about it, came out in uh, the early 90s. I want to say 93 is what my memory is shaking out. Might have been earlier. But it was a true 8-bit system on the inside. I think its graphic processor pushed it to 16 bits. And it had some really good games. It was a uh, gaming system that was built by NEC and they are a company well known for computer parts especially during the 90s i think they did a lot of nice monitors they might have had some computers and correct me if i'm wrong did they have anything to do with compact or if I, am i just am i just making that up in my head i i don't recall that uh compact was at one point bought by i think hp i'm not that. sure if they had any connection with nec but nec has made i mean they're a major um, a technology manufacturer, um, uh, you know, monitors, computers, computer components. Um, there's, uh, they're in, in a lot of different areas and, and largely on like the professional side. So when I was a kid and you'd see NEC, so I'd be flipping through computer magazines, I'd see like an NEC computer or monitor and I'd be like, oh, that might be like a medical imaging device or something. And then all of a sudden they've, they've made a, a gaming console that was, very much when I was a kid, it had all these titles. It had the type of games that when you saw them in a magazine, it'd be like, oh, that's a Japanese game. And that has like, uh, that's that's like a different genre, like genres that weren't as popular in the US. So it had, it was kind of had like that anime um, back in the, back in the nineties, anime was kind of hard to get. You have to go, uh, you have to go to the a rental store. Everything wasn't streaming. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of like the anime of video games was, uh, was, uh, was the TurboGrafx-16, similar to what the SNK games were. It kind of had this like mystique about it. Um, and and I think we've got uh, we've got the image pulled up here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, so these games were just, it was like a different type of yeah. game. And you can even see with the artwork, it's very much Japanese style artwork. And um, it wasn't, uh, so they had the PC Engine in Japan, and then they had the TurboGrafx in the United cool. States. Um, exactly. what, it was they priced... Oh, I think you're breaking up a little bit, exactly. but they did, they did um, the pricing PC. was uh, was um, comparable to, to right. other systems. Um, see, but uh, I didn't... I think I had a couple friends that had them, but um, they weren't super common like a Nintendo. I... I think we have lost Nathan, but we've still got his stream. Let me see if we can reconnect with Nathan here. Um, I know my favorite TurboGrafx-16 game was a, a TurboGrafx uh, CD game called uh, it's called Rondo of Blood Dracula X, and uh, that is on the system, which is which is really cool. Wait, so okay, so a little bit about the system before before we dig into too many games. So this actually has the TurboGrafx-16 on one side, and you can switch over to the Japanese PC Engine. Um, personally speaking, I think there are a few great gems on the uh, on the American side, but if we switch over to the PC Engine, it'll go and come back up. There we go. As you can see here, it's going down and coming back. All right, so. We've got a little bit more of the art that you were talking about on the Japanese side, which is pretty darn cool. Um, let me see what a good game to play is. I think one of the more popular games, NEC actually partnered with Hudson Soft. And yeah, and they made the system together, so that's why we get a lot of Hudson Soft games on it. And just a short history, when NEC kind of like gave up on the video game market, both in the American and Japanese side. Uh, Hudson Soft retained rights to this and then was bought out by Konami, and that's why Konami actually released this. Um, but one of the greatest games they th series they've ever done is Bomberman. And um, 
it's it's a pretty neat game, and we can go into it a little bit. And you can see the nice transition they have with that hue card. Yeah, Bomberman's a lot of fun. I believe, uh, I think there was a Dreamcast version that had four players, and that was really exciting with four players. It it might have been Dreamcast. I think Saturn might have had the best one out of the bunch, though. Now you can see, like, oh, it's so when nice. you play this with multiple players, <laughs> you're you... constantly trying to. This was uh, duck and cover long before, uh, long before. Uh, oh, what was that game? <laughs> the, the the Epic Games game. I can't can't remember the name of it now. Yeah, you're gonna have to figure. Gears of name War. Out, I can't. That description. Gears of War. So Gears of War has the duck and cover <laughs> mechanic. <laughs> and uh, and this game predated that long before, and so this this is uh, reminiscent of Duck and Cover, where you drop drop your bomb and then run for cover. So imagine trying to do this. Uh, you're very much in a player versus player in the uh, multiplayer, and so imagine trying to do this with ten players dodging everybody's bombs. Um, <laughs> that would be amazing. Oh, it's insane! Insane. So we used to, because um, my college life was completely exciting, and I put quotes around that, you can't see it. Um, we used to go over to a gentleman named Shane Bittenhausen, who uh, worked for EGM and Joystick. He used to, we used to work together at the mall a long time ago. And uh, he had a 55-inch uh, projector screen, and we would play 10-player Bomberman on Friday nights, and we late hours into the evening. So much fun really good game. Saturn was phenomenal. Um, but uh, that is a hard game to find. Um, I started uh, looking into these right away. They make three different versions. There's the... Um, they do. There is the TurboGrafx-16 version, the PC Engine version, and what's the third one? It was designed for European markets, I think. Oh, Lord. I, it was... No, it wasn't the core. No, that is... That's PCFX, PC Engine, Tober Graphic. It wasn't PCFX, was it? There, I, it may not have actually ever been a released product, but I know they have a third version of the Mini that's geared towards that European market. Oh, I, I'm going to kick myself for not knowing. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll... Gosh, almighty. I'll have to find it. But it, uh, I can tell you, this this mini was actually one of the more impressive pieces of of, of history ever rebuilt. Uh, the fact that you can you can buy a, an actual controller tap for it and have five or six players playing Bomberman at once, insane. I mean that is that is totally insane. But um, but you, you can do a lot with it. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous uh, system. But who would have thunk? I mean. It, <laughs> It's probably having more success in mini format than it is in like when it actually was released. Oh, I bet it did. And it was the when this came out, the market was a little congested with it was. Um, you had Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Genesis. Um, you had kind of these uh, uh, these options that were uh, established, and so it was really hard. Even though these games were awesome, it was hard to convince your parents to buy yet another system it was hard enough for a kid to get a nintendo and a genesis or a nintendo based console and a sega based console and so uh to then add a, a third one whether that was a neo geo or a turbo graphics <laughs> uh that was a hard sell on the parents at the time a neo geo that would that would be like can we skip a mortgage <laughs> payment this month mom and dad <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, that's that's a great system, though. So, do, so remind me, do you have that system? No, I don't. I kind of want to get one, but they're very expensive. They're actually even more expensive to collect than mm. they were originally to buy. Um, so, it's uh, I I would very much like that system. My if I went to an arcade, I, you know, as a big uh, fighting game fan, if I went to an arcade. I would frequently uh, go straight to the the Neo Geo uh, cabinets. Um, I think I've told you this before. Sometimes you go to a Neo Geo cabinet and you could have up to six titles in a cabinet. And sometimes they were just all terrible. Or it was like, 
baseball stars and and uh, magician oh. lord and you're like well i want a fighting game but uh but the odds were that it, one of the games in there you'd like but big sprites and um uh, great sound effects and great art um yeah i loved i would like to get a polymega at some point and start collecting the the cd games um because uh, that's 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 my plan if I ever get into SNK collecting. Well, they, you know they just came out with uh, the Samurai Showdown collection, right? Yeah, I saw that. I got uh, I got a bunch of I got a, I think as part of that promo, I got a bunch of free games on Twitch from mm. SNK. Um, that is, it's a really impressive. Like they did a good job on that. And they have a remake. There is like a new. There's like a new Samurai Showdown too. Is that correct? I believe so. I believe so. That was, yeah, I did not, I, I know we got trivia questions to get into, but I was playing the collection like this past weekend and I, I did not remember how absolutely difficult that series was. I mean, that, I remember like playing that in the arcades and having no issues with it and I couldn't even get past like the second round in the game and it was on normal. And like the AI in that was really well done. And it actually know. had, and I didn't even remember this at the time, but there was more strategy with that game. Yeah. Um, so you had, like, if you had your weapon, if you didn't have your weapon, if you disarmed somebody, um, there's actual strategy depending with the weapons of the combat. And in a fighting game, that was, like, unheard of at the time. Um, so, yeah, Samurai Showdown is really, really great series. Yeah, well, that's you're going to be reliving those dreams soon when you get that uh, <laughs> that system in. Um, all right, well, cool. Uh, all right, well, we've got question time, so you promised this would be hard, and I, I'm going to try to equally throw that ball, same ball back in your court. All right. So, so <laughs> do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Let's take a look. What do I have here? Question one. This one. This one is actually uh, very relevant to our TurboGrafx-16. Okay. So uh, the question is, name the graphical technique that gives the appearance of depth in a 2D game by moving background layers at different rates. You should know that when I was younger, I knew this. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess, you know, I had kids and their names replaced that information in my head. Um, I have no clue. I, I, I can see it. I know I've read it, and I know I explored this once a long time ago, but I can't remember what the term is. What you got? The term is parallax scrolling. That's it. Yes. And it basically, some systems, I believe the TurboGrafx-16 actually had support for this built in, um, but... It allows you to have one or more layers behind the main play area, and it gives the the appearance of depth. And it's as if uh, when when one element is scrolling, the other is scrolling at a different rate. And so, typically, your foreground object might look like it's moving the opposite direction of the background object, um, which is a, a non-trivial uh, thing to do because it requires a lot of uh, hardware to support it. So you see a lot of systems that don't that have not supported it in the past that developers would use tricks um, to get that to enable uh, on the system. So your your Dracula X does that really well. I know that. Because when Konami made that and Symphony of the Night, they they opened up both games with that some sort of running in the front, yes. and you would see like trees going by, but the background would be like flying. That's brilliant. That is so brilliant. Parallax scrolling. I feel like they stole that from Disney, like when they were when they were doing multi-layer cells when back in like the 30s and 40s when they're trying to give depth to the animation. It's basically the same concept, right? You just different oh, speeds, yeah. different layers. That's yep. It. No, you just it's just pouring in. I can see still pictures being separated and getting the same thing. I know they do that, in, and you can do that in video editing in Photoshop. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's all right. Well, my, mine is not that difficult. But uh, <laughs> what is Bali who? I have I have no idea. I don't think I've ever heard that word. Bali who? Bali. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> I can I've tell you never... this much: it's a game. 
It's a game. Bolly who? Now there's quotes around that word game. <laughs> Bolly who? I, I, I'm at a complete loss. I don't think I've ever heard that word in my life. It is one of the first versions of pinball that was uh, that was put together by David Gottlieb back in 1927, I think, maybe 1931. It's been a while. Um, yeah. But it was the first version of what would become pinball. And since pinball wow. is sort of arcadey, I just threw that in there. Yeah, definitely. I that is uh i've actually looked into you know classic pinball machines our family had a pinball machine probably from the 19 gosh i'd guess i'd say the 1940s or 1950s growing up so we had uh our family had an antique shop and so we'd come across uh, i think i told you the story one time of how uh this auction house we'd go to just ended up with a tron cabinet and we'd always like get really excited to go play the tron cabinet um, but we ended up with a pinball machine as kids. And so we just had growing up, had this baseball pinball machine um, that, that we always had a lot of fun playing. That's still um, cool. Yeah, that's... But uh, but yeah, I never went back that far looking up uh, pinball history. I've looked yeah. into uh, some more like modern pinball history because it's kind of fallen out of favor. But if you looked into the kind of like 90s where you started getting really like computerized technology mm-hmm. into the pinball games, um, you had some amazing pinball games uh, with just like visuals and sound and multi-ball and the one that we always played, I remember we'd go to the the beach uh, in, at the Jersey Shore when we'd visit family in Pennsylvania, and we'd always try to find the Terminator 2 pinball, which was... Oh, I remember that. <laughs> unbelievable. If you can find some YouTube videos on that, uh, Terminator 2 was, was pretty cool. It had some good arcade games, too. <laughs> I think, it did. <laughs> and that, I think that was around the time they did a park pinball machine, which was phenomenal as well. Which one? Um, but yeah, Jurassic Park. Oh yeah. It it had like the digital display, and you get like uh, uh, was it Richard Attenborough's voice coming out of the machine, and just like nice little clips. But that's pretty cool. Now yeah, pinball is a uh, is just one of those things that people have indeed, as you said kind of forgotten and and they should always explore and it back in the 70s phenomenal time for pinball um kiss pinball was beautiful uh anyway all right fire away okay question two what is the first console game to have anamorphic widescreen to have an (laughs) anamorphic widescreen format this is very obscure oh my but prior to games now now virtually all consoles now have native 16 by nine output yeah. but there was an era in gaming and um and some of them even on the n64 where you could actually output anamorphic widescreen for i don't even know what devices at the time would display <laughs> widescreen um but what was the very first game to output that anamorphic widescreen now anamorphic if you don't know since everything was all video signals were effectively standard definition in uh, up until like the early 2000s um, anamorphic would output to kind of more of a square format and then it was your device's job to stretch it out wide to scale those pixels and there was one game that was the first okay is it a popular game no (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's not fair <laughs> it, can i ask what console it was on it was on the genesis genesis oh it, and it was a sports game it was a sports game i'll that even tell you it, it, down. it was a soccer game <laughs> soccer game i don't think pele made a soccer game pele named so- soccer game on genesis soccer game it's this, not this, fifa it couldn't be FIFA. this was a very obscure question <laughs> but i feel like I it was no Im- i feel like it was an important one because where else would world cup usa 94 oh, come up i could see the cover in my head now that is that's, but uh so it, it would run in four four to three mode or 16 by nine mode 
when it ran in 16 by 9 mode, it actually ran at a higher resolution um, and then output it that squeezed format. So 1994, I don't know who was this was made for. Maybe they had like an arcade or like some setup that they actually wanted to display this on widescreen. You could actually see more of the play field in 16 by 9. But 1994, I was surprised to find out that uh, GoldenEye 64 had an anamorphic mode. So if you ever get uh, friends together to play uh, GoldenEye, you can actually stretch it and have it be correct proportions for your 16 by 9 TV. Um, so there's a bunch of other games in that era too. I think Turok would as well. Turok. Um, so yeah, uh, check out those anamorphic widescreens. Those Sony TVs, those CRTs that actually did that, where they were yeah. like Sony Vega or Vega or what it was. Can't remember what it was. They might have done that. That's pretty interesting. I had no idea. None. Soccer game. Oh gosh, they're ahead of the curve. All right. Here's an easy one. Because one of us has to get something right. <laughs> he was the founder of Electronic Arts. Who was he? Oh my gosh, I I, I don't know. I'll give founder. you a hint. He worked at Apple at one point of his life. And Steve Jobs got really angry with him when he left in nineteen eighty two. January first of nineteen eighty two. He left Apple in nineteen eighty two. At a New Year's Eve party, he told he told Jobs about a year or two prior he's out in '82, and Jobs didn't believe him. Well, I mean, Wozniak was still part of the company through the nine through the I mean, through the Apple II days. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think who else was part of the team in the '80s. I'll th- I'll throw in another hint. He helped to create. A console in the nineties. <laughs> oh my gosh! I, surely I'm gonna know this, but, uh, but I, I can't think of anybody else. I, Trip, I, Trip, Trip Hawkins. Trip Hawkins. I know the name, but um, yeah, I need to brush up on some Trip Hawkins history. I've I've heard the name, but um, but yeah, that that name was not really on my my radar as far as uh, history He's goes. Interest- He's a very interesting fellow. Um, he he created Electronic Arts with the help of Don Valentine, a venture capitalist who helped with Pong, and uh, he created it for artists when it was before it was like loot crates. And uh, he um, he <laughs> he left, and they don't acknowledge him anymore that he actually created it. And he went and created Panasonic 3DO. Uh, okay yeah and then uh i think he's like digital chocolate is what he's doing now which is a browser-based gaming platform he's a very interesting guy <laughs> but I, but yep i will have to look into him some more you should uh let's see so question three this one may or may not be difficult uh <laughs> what is the name for the video arcade standard that includes specifications for connectors, video format, and communication. <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> this sounds so interesting, though. And I know there's going to be a good ex- explanation about this. It so was. Can- uh, it was a. Uh, it was a uh, association that includes. Uh, Bandai, Namco, Sega, Taito, Tecmo, Capcom, Konami, and Atlas. <laughs> it was formed in Japan. Oh, my Lord. I have no Any idea. No, it's it's j- JAMA. Have you ever JAMA. heard of oh my JAMA gosh. boards? Yes. Yes, Stands I for Japan Amusement Machine and Marketing Association. I didn't know what it stood ni- for. 1981. I never knew what it stood for until I looked it up. But, um, but yeah, you can get, you can find games, um, and you can even get home versions of like a, a JAMA system, and uh, you can buy arcade games and and play them in your house. I, you know, that sounds like a wonderful thing. That. <laughs> I always wonder what JAMA stood for. That is, I remember it would come up on uh, some of the arcade screens, right? Before a game would start. Oh, yeah. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, that is mind blowing. I'm going to have to explore that a little bit more now. I'm writing that down. I got to write that down. Jamma. All right. <laughs> that was really good. That's like, that's like if you ask somebody what MPEG stood for and motion picture experts group. It's such a stupid name for it. <laughs> <laughs> I if I didn't looking... work, if I didn't do this much work in video, I would have no idea what that stood for. Oh, it's such a pretentious name for a video format. <laughs> um, seriously. All right. So here's an easy one. I know this is easy and I know you got this because you're a tech guy. So was the Sega CD a true 32-bit system and why? <laughs> I'm going to say no because everybody liked to falsify their, their bit numbers they did. My my guess is it had a 16-bit CPU and a 16-bit GPU, and they just added the two numbers. That is very close. They actually had two separate 16-bit CPUs, one in Sega in the Sega CD, one in the Genesis, and <laughs> they they the biggest problem with the system is that they toted that it that combined to a 32-bit uh, uh, piece of hardware, but when developers work for it, they could only work with one processor or the other. <laughs> so <laughs> it was you one just, of the more... It's so just creative. add the bits. Just add the bits together. You know, That's all you got to do. TurboGrafx did it. You know, why not? That's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that is good. But yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, the prelude to the Sega Saturn, which was a true 32-bit... System yes. S, oh, true. Um, it also had two processors that hated each other. So that's... <laughs> anyway, okay. So, that, so a question point. four is completely uh, along the same lines of that question. <laughs> and it is, what is the Wonder Mega? The Wonder Mega, is that made by Bandai? It is that's made it. by Victor. Victor. Who is Victor? And it's relevant to the question you just asked. <laughs> All I can think of is like some guy in New York is just like, I'm selling a system. <laughs> My name's Victor. You know, just Wonder Mega. I remember that name. I just don't remember what it went to. And I'm, I'm looking back and I want to say it's related to the Wonder Swan, but I know it's not. <laughs> think, think Mega. And the question you just asked, it's related to your uh, Genesis uh, question. <laughs> How is that related? Wonder Mega. That's my Victor. The Victor thing is stumping me because it's just, I don't it's, understand. And the Victor is totally, okay, Victor is known in the U.S. as JVC. Oh, that doesn't. Because JVC did some hardware, I know they they uh, the JVC XI was something they created. And I think the XI was that wasn't a Sega CD combo. That was a TurboGrafx 16 combo, wasn't it? <laughs> Doesn't matter. I'm going myself oh, up. Here. You're so close. You're so close. <laughs> the the Wonder Mega okay. is an all-in-one Mega CD system. It includes the Genesis oh, and wow. the Mega CD in one box. It was made by Victor who uh, Victor is JVC, uh, is what JVC is known as in Japan. Ah, um, I had no idea. I had no idea either and uh, until I just came across a, uh, came across a video on this. Um, but it sold for a higher price than the two units separately, and so it did not sell very well. But made so, by a, a Sega CD, made by JVC... So, so Panasonic did something similar with Sega CD. Didn't they make like a laser disc player that played Sega CD games? They I think they did. They, they might have. There's there are a handful of stories uh, about companies like third party companies licensing technology yeah. like that. Yeah, those were the days. Eh? <laughs> you had like six <laughs> companies making the same thing. Um, that was really good. I'm gonna have to. I'm seriously gonna have to look that up. I don't remember that. I mean, it sounds familiar. But I don't remember what that looks like. <laughs> All right. A little bit more elegant than the uh, than the Tower of Power <laughs> of the Genesis and the, the Sega CD. 
I think that's funny they named that the Tower of Power. They could actually <laughs> hook in like a 32X onto a mini. <laughs> that's so funny. All right. All right. All right. Who struck the deal with Steven Spielberg to create E.T.? And this person sort of kind of didn't work at Atari. And how much did they give Spielberg for the licensing? Oh, gosh. Oh, I... They weren't it an Atari a... employee. Not an Atari employee. Uh, you can get Nolan Bushnell out of there because he wasn't oh, there. Oh gosh. Okay, that was that was the person I was thinking of. Who? It has been a while since I've brushed up on the the ET saga, the ET video game saga. It's so good. <laughs> gosh, was right, what do was we, that? What do we start with the was... price. Start with the price. <laughs> You know, can you guess how many? Oh, the, how much it paid for the license? Gosh, I feel like it's something either really high or really low. <laughs> it was almost. I'll put. I'll throw out a hint. It was almost the price that that this company paid for Atari, and they paid twenty eight million dollars for Atari. Oh my gosh! <laughs> this is nineteen eighties money, by the way, like early nineteen eighties money. That's that. That's a lot of money. I I do not I do not remember. I've heard the story before, but I I cannot remember the players. A man named Steve Ross, who is the head of Warner Communications, um, went to a Hollywood party, rubbed some elbows with Spielberg during the party without telling Atari. Offered twenty five million dollars for the license of ET. Right there on the spot to Spielberg, who, if you were Spielberg done you know that's and then proceeded to tell atari at the time i think ray kazar had, uh, was running it at the time as a post nolan bushnell uh hey i i gave steven spielberg 25 million dollars we're gonna make a et before christmas and this was like august <laughs> they hadn't even heard of the idea hey and, at yeah. least they took the time to do it right <laughs> did they <laughs> That thing needs a remastering right there. That's, <laughs> E.T., that. yeah. There has never been an E.T. remake, has there? No, but wouldn't that be cool? Like, you could, yeah. you could get the modern, Unreal. <laughs> modern graphics, VR maybe, so you really feel like you're in the pit. <laughs> Constantly just falling. <laughs> <laughs> you get the Unreal 5 engine involved in that, and it just becomes a beautiful thing. What the horror. <laughs> But yes, that is a that is a fun scenario and saga, and yeah, you should revisit it when you can. <laughs> All right, what, okay. you, what, Quest, what you got? Question five? five. This is super obscure, but um, this is very obscure, and I apologize in advance. <laughs> it's okay. w- what is the RDI Halcyon? You know, I just want to let you know. I actually know there's something called the Halcyon somewhere. <laughs> and I, when you throw RDI in there, my memory is like, I got no clue. No clue. Oh, so it sounds R- like a piece know of who, hardware. Do you know who RDI is? No. RDI developed Dragon's Lair and Space Ace. Oh, yes. That's, yes. They were a tiny company, too. It, Partner with Don Bluth and made those things. <laughs> so RDI the, Halcyon. Was that the technology they used to to run and run the laser discs, or or is that just the name of the company? Oh, you're you are on the right track. You are <laughs> so on the right track, and I will I won't I won't make you uh make you uh. G- d- ponder this uh, any further because it is kind of obscure it is a laser disc gaming system yeah um and so it was set to release in 1985 and here i will uh i will play a little video in oh. the background while i go over some of this i'm so excited about this it's some, to the people and so this is this, this was an episode of computer chronicles and um the uh, the, uh, the movie, RDI Halcyon, Halcyon was a, was a the, so the company was Hal. developed with Hal, you uh, were able to those two games. To... And so anybody who's 
anybody who's uh, from that era remembers the Space Ace and Dragon's Lair game because they just had like amazing graphics and it was because they were they had come from Laserdisc um, so they could basically have a, a, a movie playing on uh, their uh, Laserdisc and it was uh, would accept game inputs now you, it was all kind of pre determined uh, like motion but uh, the the visuals of it were, were just unheard of back in around 1985 and so they took the money from Dragon's Lair and Space Ace and decided to make their own hardware. And so this video that's playing right now is, is a demonstration of that hardware on Computer Chronicles. Oh, on and uh, it also Let's had voice control and, and speech to text in 1985. Uh, as, as you re- and you uh, with Hal before, so we can, now, let's when, see. When we turn him on, all you have to do is say your name. He will recognize your and voice. If you and can, recognize who you are. If you ever okay. so can look up this Computer Chronicles video, you watch this guy uh, kind of wrangling with the voice inputs. It's pretty hilarious. I have your voice print. Please say your name or else press any key. Stuart. Nice to see you again, Stuart Chefe. <laughs> Only about 12 of these units were ever made, but it's amazing. Like Dragon's Lair and Space Ace, something that uh, from gamers from that era definitely recognize. It's it's interesting to think that those people made a uh, a console that actually got to Computer Chronicles, which was a very uh, popular computer and technology show at the time. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I had no idea. I didn't. I thought that like when the industry collapsed, that was like the end, and and Rick Dyer <laughs> had just made some money and just left. But that's pretty neat. Okay. All right. Last one for me. All right. This is this is like you're gonna get this, and we're gonna walk away knowing somebody got a question right today. Uh, all right. So, <laughs> who is the father of video games? Um. Oh my gosh. Uh, it's I feel like it's not Nolan Bushnell. You would be correct. And it's probably the guy that invented Pong and I cannot remember his name. I'm always terrible with names. He invented Simon as well. <laughs> you got this. I I am I do not think I'm going to come up with it. I'm going to know uh. this name. Ralph Bear. Ralph Bear. One of the nicest people you could have ever met when he was uh, when he was still alive. And uh invented was the father of video games officially. They had everybody had given Nolan Bushnell the the moniker and up until probably the early two thousands. And then somebody said that's not right and mm-hmm. changed it. But um but Bear did the Magnavox Odyssey ultimately from the brown box which he originally invented. He did the Simon and he was the inventor of the light gun and the TV. So the zapper for the Nintendo, that was his technology. So the guy really paved the way for, for consoles and for what the video game industry would become, but not to sell Nolan Bush, no short. He was the reason it became a thing in households. So that was a, that was his contribution. So Yeah. The, the, some of the most interesting parts of those early video games, whether it's Bushnell or, or bear is just all of the tricks they had to do. A lot of the tricks had to do with manipulating video signals and um, like playing with scan lines and, and to think that they had things like uh, vector based output. Um, it, it's really interesting to go back and watch like how they developed some of these techniques. And now we have very standardized ways to work with hardware. And back in the day, it was trying to figure out how to make the hardware do something it wasn't meant to do. Um, and then they made a, a eventually a, a multi-billion dollar, it turned that into a multi-billion dollar industry. It's really interesting stuff. When, when we talked to him in 2012, um, uh, when he was still alive, he was he yelled at one of my students when we skyped in with him, and the student was like, "So how did you program your system? Like what language?" And he goes, "We didn't have language. We had like like hardware and like chips. That's not what I do." <laughs> and we're like, 
it was a good question, but it's also a bad one. But uh, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, that it was amazing. And it, to hear him describe how he isolated the light, the light in the in the tube, and got it to do what he wanted it to do was just fascinating. But um, anyway. Thanks for playing the questions. That was fun. Uh, the, next week, we will get next, one right. <laughs> next week, we're going to get one. That's a guarantee to the audience. <laughs> we will, because it's an unpopular popular opinion. <laughs> we can't be wrong on that. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, thank it's you. been a good show. And uh, Anyway, uh, thank you, everybody. And thanks for watching. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.